going to hand over to Gita, I think, at this point. Ten minutes. <laughs> Ten minutes will go while we're looking for... Um, okay. Uh, we're at the end of a very long day of a very, very intense conference, and uh, I thought I'd um, use my time, which was to uh, uh, to uh, look at some of the themes that have come up through the day and see if we can um, propose some ways forward that I know the organizers, I'm sure, are uh, thinking about uh, that as well. Um, one of the things I, I think all the speakers have shown is that we're talking about movements of the religious right are movements that feed off each other. They are each other's nightmare, but they're also each other's mirrors. They react and reinforce each other. And therefore, trying to mobilize by using one, you know, it, 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 it just uh, uh, identifying one movement as the only extreme movement and that the others can mobilize against it on the basis of what Dilip was talking about, a communal basis, on a basis of community rather than a basis of universalism, will lead us into a mess. The situation that Chulani and Fezun were describing in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, we haven't heard very much about the Buddhist right wing, but it's there in Sri Lanka, Burma, and other places. And uh, the Tamils were massacred, you know, under the gaze of the world, or rather the, the sort of unseeing gaze of the world, uh, because in the logic of the war on terror, if you crush a terrorist group, it doesn't matter how many civilians die in that attempt. And I think a lot of the war crimes that happened then have continued to, to uh, show, as they showed in their very complex presentation, of the, you know, a majoritarian um, fundamentalism and a minority fundamentalism. And we can't get into the the trap, which, which certainly has happened among liberal Westerners, of deciding to support uh, minority uh, movements of the far right um, uh, against a majority. We have to be aware of the relationship of both. Now, the, the, uh, for me, and we will all have our own lineages. Uh, Behram had his lineage of, the, of, of, of Iran as one of the, the first theocratic state that was, was uh, founded, um, uh, the first Islamic state. We should never forget that. Uh, for me, one of the lineages is of actually uh, a time when the attempt to found such a thing was defeated, and that was in the 71 War of Liberation in Bangladesh, uh, where the Pakistani army was defeated by a people's struggle, and the Islamists that were supporting them, the jamaat e islami and other groups that were supporting them were also thoroughly defeated. There is an alternative to um, uh, doing deals with fundamentalists, and that is to sideline and delegitimize and defeat them. And if the West had been involved in that struggle, the West tried to uh, support the Pakistanis in their, armed uh, you know, their armed campaign, uh, Kissinger and Nixon, the left should remember that, um, and they were sidelined and defeated as well. If they had been involved in peace negotiations as they have been now, they would have been trying to uh, do deals with the Islamists and uh, carve up that state. Uh, and although Bangladesh has been through many bad times, and indeed there's many human rights crises on now, a space, a space for secularism, as Sultana described earlier, a secular, con secular socialist and democratic constitution was established. And if you look at Bangladesh's figures on women's empowerment and maternal mortality and many other indicators, people have been able to mobilize. In spite of all sorts of bad governments, there is a space for women's mobilization and civil society mobilization, which many other states don't have. It would not have happened if they hadn't won that struggle in 71. The Dips just told me, because I was talking about how the West um, would have carved up the state. He said, actually, there was a plan. The Canadians had a peace plan. A lot of the people who fled into India, there were about 10 million refugees in India. A lot of them were Hindus who'd uh, fled from Bangladesh because they were being massacred inside. They were also Muslims massacred as well. So the Canadians came up with this clever plan that India should just 
keep the Hindu refugees. They, they didn't have the right to go back to their actual homes in Bangladesh. This is what the West does. And our dilemma from the left is that the discourse of most of the left is to look at the, the bad things the West does without understanding their imperialist strategies of control, uh, dividing and ruling and using communal and fascist and fundamentalist forces. So we know that... We know that the coalition that the, that, that the US is involved with are the founders and promoters and, 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 uh, of ISIS, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. We have had information during this conference of the, and, 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 and of, of the complicity of Turkey with a Muslim Brotherhood regime in promoting ISIS, and we have watched Kur the Kurdish people being massacred on the Syrian border because the Kurds closed the border into and out of Kobane for humanitarian and other sorts of assistance, but kept the rest of the border open so that the jihadis could come back and forth and have uh, you know, been uh, completely complicit uh, in that situation. Now, when the problem with saying that usually is that it means you know, we turn our backs. And I'm by we over here, we're sitting in London and we're part of um, Western progressive movements that have turned their backs on uh, on these situations. Uh, I remember when uh, uh, Al-Qaeda had invaded Mali, had, having a discussion with a very prominent peace activist in this country, uh, and she said to me, what do you think should be done about Mali? And I said, look, I understand that a pacifist movement uh, is in a difficult position calling for military intervention, but the least you can do is stand in solidarity with the people of Mali who are being destroyed, whose culture is being destroyed, whose religion is being destroyed, whose shrines are being destroyed, whose documents are being destroyed, whose art is being destroyed, whose musicians are having their hands cut off. Stand in solidarity with those people. At least you can do that. <laughs> but what did they do? They went around looking among all the Malian groups for one set of people who said the West should not intervene to stand with the people of Mali. That was their idea of solidarity, you know? So we, we have to find another form of solidarity and we have to resurrect the old solidarities that have existed among people who have organized across borders. And I think we have to be very clear. I hope people understood the message, messages that have come out from diverse panels on this meeting that when we're talking about the postmodernists, the postcolonials, the leftists, and so on, who are allying with fundamentalists. This is not unwitting. Let us understand they know what they are doing, and they're doing it because they believe what they're doing. Let us leave them to one side on the scrap heap of history. Let us build solidarities between the older generation that understood another form of solidarity on the left and on, among progressives and social democrats and people who support freedom and anti-colonialism as we understood it a long time ago, and let us build uh, relationships with younger people who are fighting for their freedoms, their freedoms for personal lives, their freedoms to be themselves, their freedom to practice religion or not as they choose. Let us build those relationships and let us move forward because there is a lost generation that has happened. We cannot convince them, leave them aside. I think that's, that for me is a very key message. So when we have this defense of people uh, in the defense of secularism, which I'm sure will be talked about in the secularism manifesto, let us also work with a transformative understanding of human rights which, uh, and the understanding that secular values underpin human rights and they should be overtly defended uh, in, in human rights. Um, and so that we look to uh, the human rights conventions, those people who work on these issues, I know not everybody does. It's not gonna be done for us by the human rights organization, it has to be done by us. Uh, so we need to look and see what we can see in the conventions. Finally, um, there are people who are gathering, uh, uh, activists and others um, on, uh, in, in human rights, uh, you know, not human rights, outside Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and so on, who are looking to see whether to, uh, to call for uh, humanitarian intervention and intervention by the Security Council. Let us get a proper discussion internationally from our own solidarities, asking that the peoples who are under attack, 
by the, the wars that are going on at the moment should not be left to struggle on their own. That the Kurds should not be left on the one hand to carry the banner uh, of, of, uh, for Western governments to be the front line of the fighting by themselves without proper support, while at the same time, other people are hoping that the Kurdish problem will be solved because they will all be massacred in the struggle. Let us know we're in dangerous times, that the war on terror was a dirty war, and, it's, and, and the deep states, and the, the security services, which are in bed with the same people that they're fighting, are going to continue that. But let, us con but let us not be cynical and turn away and come forward with, the, with our own plans. Let us not uh, be frightened of standing up for what we believe. Thank you very much. What a panel. Um, being a chair is always a thankless task and it's something that I, I never particularly enjoy doing. Um, can I ask you all to help me, um, while I gather my, my, um, my voice, to thank every, everyone on the panel here, but all of the speakers today, um, but particularly this panel. <laughs>